Hi, I'm Sarah from The Upcoming. So lovely Hi. to be able to speak to all of you. Um, maybe you could just kick off with an introduction to this wonderful, wonderful film, Lapwing. Um, for people who don't know anything about it, what can they expect? I don't know, Philip, if you want to take that question. Um, yeah, well, it's, um, it's a psychological thriller set in the 1500s um, in a remote part of the UK on the Lincolnshire coast. And it charts the uh, the experiences of a group of salt farmers, a kind of nomadic group of people that are outside society. And um, they take a group of um, Egyptian or Egyptian travelers um, into their care uh, to, to give them transport to, uh, to uh, Europe so they can escape the sort of tyranny that's taking place in England at that time in Queen Mary. Um, and in the course of that, uh, our protagonist, uh, Patience, played by Hannah, um, who is a, a selectively uh, mute girl. She has a stammer. Um, and during that period, having a stammer was, was deemed as a very um, afflicting uh, case that would mean that you were almost outside of society. You were no longer human. You, did, you were devoid of, um, of the ability to be able to speak the word of God and to, um, to preach. So it made you... Uh, an unwelcome part of society she falls in love with the son of the egyptian family and that relationship sparks a wave of anger and retribution from the salt farming community's leader and her brother-in-law david and i believe it's the feature debut for both you as the director and you as a writer laura so maybe you could just tell us a bit about how you decided that this was the film that you wanted to make um, and I guess you can see some parallels perhaps with kind of what's happening in, you know, in our contemporary culture in terms of xenophobia, the hostile environment. Um, so was that one of the motivations as well to kind of, you know, even though it's set in the 16th century, find a story that can also ring true today? Absolutely. I mean, so mine and Phil's background was um, we began working together on historical short film. So we'd always had a very clear sense of how interesting it can be to tell stories about the present through the lens of the past. Um, so we kind of knew that that was very much thematically something that we wanted to do with the way that we structured and the way that we created Lapwing. Um, and Lapwing itself as a project actually began life as a short film. Um, our kind of initial plan was that we were going to make it as our next short film project. Um, and, you know, we'd had some success with kind of garnering funding for short films previously and started down that path with Lapwing, started having some conversations. Um, and lots of people were kind of saying to us, you can't make a period drama on a tiny budget, even a short film. And I think something about, um, I think something about the challenge that was inherent in that statement kind of made us all the more determined to do it. But then as we started to discuss it more and more, actually um, where that took us was to a, a slightly terrifying place of kind of going actually there's such a big story here there's such a big world there's so many important themes that really resonate for Phil and I you know it's very much a film about the experience of being in an isolated environment and the way that that can be oppressive but it can also once you unlock something um, of yourself and that sense of selfhood which is really the journey that patience goes on you know through this bond that she develops with Rumi the young traveler man it enables her to access parts of herself that she's perhaps not been able to before because she's lived such a sheltered existence and that enables her to kind of start to look look to the future and look to the horizons that have kind of always been there but never really been anything tangible for her to imagine a different life um so you know phil and i felt for a long time that the the coastline of lincolnshire was an extremely evocative kind of environment that really captured some of those themes of isolation and oppression and yet freedom that we wanted to explore with the piece um and then from i guess from a per kind of personal standpoint 
um, from a writing perspective, you know, the female voice and exploring the female experience has always been really integral to what I do. And I think, you know, Phil has such a beautiful and sensitive directorial style that really enabled, you know, enabled him to, to tell that story and, and, you know, working with Hannah's incredible performance to bring, to bring the character of Patience to life whilst meeting all the struggles of having a silent protagonist as well, which, you know, inevitably always presents its its difficulty both I think on the page and then in the transference onto the screen but I think you know they were challenges that we felt really passionate about addressing because it was so it was so integral to patients' story that she was selectively mute as well that it was you know it was essentially a choice that she was making initially from a place of suppression but then actually from a place of empowerment as the film goes on. And Phil did you want to Add anything from your perspective as a director? No, I mean that the we, we, as I said, Laura always, Laura and I always wanted to tell a story about isolation, and I'd I'd heard uh, different things locally about the salt marshes and about these communities that would go there, and we'd discussed it quite a, you know quite a lot of um, length about how we'd like to explore that kind of environment because it's almost like you know it's like being on the moon. If you were there, you would be so isolated that you know you couldn't you wouldn't be able to just go and find supplies you would have to you know make your own find your own and it was very much like being almost like being in the new world during that period that idea of um of conquest of, of taking places that were inhospitable was the you know this was the first part of certainly the the english if you like journey of um of, of taming places and this was one place in in the country we live in which is still untamed even now being there filming there was was um an expedition in its own right but um but yeah i think that that sense of isolation that we have now through our modern mediums you know even though we've got social media even though we've constantly got access to people i think a lot of people feel more alone now than ever and certainly coming out of you know coming out of the um the pandemic where we're evaluating ourselves as social creatures and just how important it is to have a security of the self which is something that you know patience develops throughout the piece and actually she despite her um disability she's the strongest character in the film and despite the fact that she's also the, you know the most ostracized and the most put upon she's the strongest character in the film and i think that's that's part of the heart of the story we wanted to get to it's about personal strength it's about being able to overcome anything that is presented to you if you choose to and she makes the concerted choice in the film to defeat those obstacles in her path and regain her independence or gain her independence in the first place. Um, and they're all themes that, you know, we're really excited about exploring. We also, you know, we're very passionate about the idea that history, history repeats itself and nothing changes, but we don't change, humans don't change. And, you know, this idea that people in a historical setting are for some reason less intelligent or aren't as resourceful or, you know, there's a lot of kind of um, heightened historical films where people speak in an exaggerated way. It's all very postured. That to me doesn't communicate well. I think you can. I think you can be just as impactful emotionally and psychologically in a historical film as you can in a you know in a modern set piece. And actually, I think in some respects you can be more impactful because of that separation with our society that then makes you mirror our society and start looking for. Um, those similarities that shouldn't be there anymore and unfortunately still are. And Hannah, just to bring you into the conversation. So obviously the role of patients is challenging on multiple levels, not least, you know, not much dialogue or, or almost no dialogue there for you to work with. And also some really challenging scenes to get through, but also, you know, an amazing character and fascinating character to play. So what was it that um, attracted you to, to playing that role? I think yeah all of that really it's I guess as a as an actor that's what you're looking for you're looking for kind of important stories to tell and I guess with with Patience's story it did feel important because like we've all been saying it's it's something that uh, as women we you know we've all felt at some point or another unfortunately because these things haven't changed that um, you know there's a lot of victim blaming that goes on in the film and that's something that very much still happens today um, they're kind of feeling like you've got you don't have as much of a voice um, is something that I think is all really relevant today so that felt like a really important 
story to be part of um and and bringing that into the you know sort of talking about it like that just felt really important to me um and then yeah in terms of the role I guess if it, it's exciting because um there is no dialogue to rely on <laughs> also no dialogue to learn so that's you know <laughs> a, a positive um <laughs> but yeah it's like finding finding the ways of communicating um without without dialogue um and i i went to uh i've spoken about this before i i, I went to an amazing place called the michael palin center uh, which is in london and um he set it up because his dad had a stammer um, so they have this centre and I, I went there and I spoke to these women um, who have stammers and it's also uh, less common in women um, for some reason. Um, it's more common for men to have a stammer, which um, I didn't know, um, but there are lots of women who, who do. Um, and I spoke to these women who told me what it was like and what it feels like and that's obviously in today's world. Um, so anything that they feel now is kind of exaggerated back then because, you know, she would have been labelled as a witch, um, sort of, yeah, not human because she can't kind of do anything like get married or pray or anything like that. Um, so it's kind of so much, you know, so many kind of suppressed emotions going on there. Um, but they were incredible to speak to. Um, and on the first <laughs> the first couple of days, I was planning on not speaking for the whole uh, shooting period. <laughs> didn't didn't quite manage that one, um, but I did. I did uh, for the first. I think it was three three days. The first three days. Yeah. Um, I didn't speak, and uh, and that's three days is quite a long time. <laughs> I can't do that. <laughs> it's, really, it's really like. But it was so interesting because, um, you know, on the one hand, you realise that people do kind of, um, not in a bad way, but they do kind of ignore you because people aren't quite sure how to communicate with you. And it's frustrating for you because you can't kind of, you can't fully communicate what, what it is that you want. Um, but then as it went on, I realised that there is that power in it as well, because I think it makes other people feel slightly uncomfortable. Um, but what it does for you is that you suddenly realize you don't have to do that thing that I know I always do, which is trying to fill the silence and just saying something for the sake of it. So I think that's kind of um, part of Patience's power is that actually she she doesn't feel the need to kind of fill that silence. She's comfortable being um, being quiet. She's comfortable kind of being in her own thoughts and that gives her a sense of power. And I think that's kind of what drives David mad because he can't he doesn't know what's going on in her head and I think that really gets him and that's part of her power so it was it was really exciting playing a character like that and, and working in that way it was yeah it was a bit of a bit of a dream role to be honest <laughs> and maybe if we can come to the character of David because I mean we see kind of you know his bigotry his xenophobia all kind of conflate and you know he his you know a 16th century kind of study in toxic masculinity in lots of ways so you know, how did you see his character and obviously an incredible performance by Emma you know alongside Hannah and like doing some so much intensity in, in their relationship but did you see him as purely an evil character or is there also that side of trying to understand how men like that you know you could probably see some um, parallels to men that we see in, in contemporary society you know what is driving that and, and can we have empathy and sympathy with something like that yeah I mean that's absolutely both Laura and I spoke at length about, about you know this character that she created that that we wanted to have a level of empathy with we wanted to try and actually do two things. One, make our audience uncomfortable with the fact that you know villains are, are not just villains. You know, in and people in our society, in every society throughout history, have never really. I don't think there are many people that have ever actually labelled themselves, you know, as a villain. I'm a bad guy. Um, I think everything he does and what's fascinating about his character, it comes from a place that he thinks is correct. He thinks he's doing the right thing, and even if he's fooling himself he's still doing it for a, a, a higher reason there's nothing there's nothing that's not considered in in his path and uh, there's a part of him that believes what he's doing for patients is helping her and is protecting her 
and that creates a fascinating dynamic it would have been very easy to have wheeled out a you know a bad guy and to have made him someone who you know we all boo at when he comes onto the screen but i think and this is a, you know a huge testament to Emmett's performance as well is the fact that there are so many layers to his character he's broken he's flawed he's obviously and you know something that we really wanted to impress was that all of these people are coming out of a society so part of these these small salt farm communities was that most of them were normally in trouble of some kind and had to get out of traditional you know towns and villages so this was a place they could earn money so they're all have questionable backgrounds um but he plays it to you know in such a layered and nuanced way that there are moments i hope where we do actually try and comprehend what's going on in his head and why he's making these decisions which I don't you often think you know certainly with textbook bad guys they're just bad guys you know they're there they're there as a, a tool to help us understand the plight or the journey of the protagonist whereas actually he has his own journey and yeah. that journey that sort of vortex that he gets that he creates sucks everybody else in and he's becomes the catalyst that means that patience finds her feet and that's you know it's testimony to laura's amazing writing and i think it's like insecurity as well because sorry because <laughs> so much of that kind of toxic masculinity does come from insecurity it all like, comes from fear yeah it all comes from and that's something that we're sort of only just scratching the surface on in our society now is kind of how young boys are educated and how they're taught Absolutely. to deal with their emotions and i think that that's part like yeah he, I think his performance was so stunning because you do have moments where you kind of feel sorry for him and then you feel like horrible that you feel sorry for him and it's it's conflicting I think that's one way that I sorry Laura I'm, I'm gonna okay, cool. I, know, I know you're gonna say something better than me anyway but I'll just I'll just uh, <laughs> chuck in but part of you know being a man directing this film you know it was often times when I felt that perhaps I didn't have I, I wasn't the right person to direct the film because I wasn't a woman and I couldn't, you know, follow Patience's path in the right way. But I actually think that there was a huge benefit to me to be being able to comprehend that that toxic masculine, masculinity in a way that was from a male's perspective because we experience it as well in a different way, but it's slightly more comprehensible for me because I understand a bit of that fear. I understand that most people most men do things that are unpalatable through fear and it's always through insecurity and it's through the fear of the self and fear of your um your place in society and all these things that you know very much now we are having conversations about because young men are finding it harder to have a place in society but that's because people like Emmett's character David were abusing that fear and using that fear as a weapon and becoming and that's unfortunately still the case with an enormous amount of men in the world but i do hope that a performance like his perhaps makes some people ask some questions that need to be asked go on Laura, sorry no no not at all i think i was just going to add as well that i think it was something that we made a very conscious decision that we didn't want to be scared of the complexity of character in terms of all of the characters and in terms of as well something i think that's was really interesting for me to explore on the page and then to see the way that Phil and Hannah and Emmett and um, Sarah Whitehouse as well who plays Lizzie bring the complexity of each of their characters to the dynamics between them once they're on screen and you know the, I think it's is kind of I never want to shy away from the fact that there aren't binaries you know as as Phil and Hannah were both saying there are kind of black and whites of good and bad and this person is this particular thing you know we all make mistakes we all make bad decisions and we all feel emotions that sit uncomfortably with us as well and I think there's you know I was really interested to kind of lean into the top of that relationship between abuser and the abused as well you know there is there is a terrifying and unsettling connection between patients and David that patients has to go on a huge emotional journey in order to sever that that toxic bond that she essentially feels with David you know it's I think it's that complexity of it's not 
these scenarios are never simply one-sided you know it's it's never just kind of David feeling an, a toxic attachment towards patients she has essentially been groomed as well you know she has been completely kind of brainwashed by this situation and by this very toxic but very dangerously charismatic individual and I think those were some of the beautiful traits that Emmett brought to the role that really kind of enabled us I think to to go even deeper and, and even kind of darker than than perhaps we even imagined at, at the start of the process I think that's probably fair isn't it Phil that you know it, 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 it took it to, to new levels which is obviously wonderful and exactly what you what you want when you start working with the actors on set in that way. I guess the other thing I was thinking when I was watching it is, you know, there's been quite a few films kind of like in the indie sector that kind of sit in a similar space, you know, like quite stylized, you know, with complex female characters, Lady Macbeth, The Nightingale, The Witch. Um, and, and, and there seems like there's a thread there. Um, um, do you see this film as kind of having something in common with those movies? Um, and why do you think we are seeing kind of a trend of this type of film? What is it that is so intriguing about it? And I think it's perhaps something about, you know, the unsettling nature of it, but also exploring um, female characters in a way, particularly in period dramas that we haven't seen before. Yeah, I mean, we, we're definitely going through a resurgence at the moment with films that sort of walk a fine line between uh, folk horror, history, and, uh, you know, the female protagonists um a sort of event film they 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 existed quite a lot in the 70s and there were you know there were quite a few excellent films even you know you can even rate some of the hammer horror films as having you know these strong female protagonists that go on you know challenging journeys with with or with uh, with obstacles around them but i do think that at the moment we are just finding a new type of voice for female protagonists and i, I think that that voice comes from uh, a, a journey that we've been going on for free, for a few years, thankfully, where where we're exploring female narratives in a different way outside the, the textbook. Let's talk about issues here. Let's talk about you know, let's talk about the things that have should have been said for a long time. There are cleverer ways to do that, and I think that these vehicles um, that are around the moment, and we do very much. You know, it's lovely to hear our our name. You know, alongside such fantastic um, modern films, because we, you know, we we love those movies. Um, but I think that it's it's an evolution of cinematic storytelling that's just finding its feet again, and we are having these diverse, interesting, powerful female characters going on very exciting cinematic journeys. But you know, it's not it's not such a new thing you look at films you know you could even cite alien for example as a you know prime example of a great director ridley scott saying against the odds in a film where it was meant to be a male pr pr a protagonist and him saying well actually do you know what this would be far more interesting if this was a, a, a bit of female and everyone went you can't have a female action lead that's ridiculous <laughs> and of course you know it's, she's one of the most iconic female action leads of all time or action leads full stop of all time and I'm hoping that this kind of um, this kind of film, which has got a kind of um, a slightly edgy and um, and left field audience, I think the audience themselves have changed, which has changed the dynamic of the films that are being made. Um, I think we'll will spawn some even more interesting films in the years to come. I think that this is the start of not a new style of film by any means, but certainly of looking at characters as characters rather than being a female protagonist male protagonist you know and genres are blurring as well which i think is just exciting you know, from a storytelling perspective it gives us certainly plenty more to work with i agree i think there's i think there's a new space that's kind of opening up in terms of the use of genre and and setting that's kind of opening a kind of metaphorical area where the emotional experience of any protagonist but particularly a female protagonist can kind of be interrogated perhaps in a way that it's it's is just different and maybe slightly more complex than before you know mm -hmm. if I kind of think of the the films that you've mentioned and the films that you know have been very influential for me, for Phil, for us, as we, you know, developed Lapwing and, and think about pieces um, like Midsummer, for example, you know, those kinds of iconic 
um, you know, the blending of genre and the twists on narrative conventions that are being put into place are all to do with um, us getting a new angle on what it, what emotions that female character is experiencing at the heart of the drama, at the heart of the storytelling. And I think, you know, I think if there was one thing that we really wanted to do with Lapping, it was to really lean into the psychology of all of the characters and to find space within a very big world and, you know, a, a world that kind of is full of its own contradictions as well, you know, a landscape that is all about freedom and space, but also about constriction and isolation, you know, finding within those contradictions, finding the psychological space to really kind of explore what does liminality mean in this in this kind of arena? And what does that look like for the young woman at the center of it experiencing it? Um, so I think that's that's a really exciting shift that's that's happened and is kind of you know very much in conversation with with the new trend of of female genre films that are kind of coming out at the moment and I think it's just a very exciting place to be and to be working. I guess finally we've touched on um, lots of points already, but if you were going to summarise, what would you hope people would take away from watching the film? Laura. Oh wow! Um, I I think for us we really we really want to expose the emotional complexity of a character who has experienced extreme emotional abuse, the issues of coercive control, but really to hammer home the message that there is always there is always resilience even in the darkest of times, and I think even when situations seem utterly hopeless and you know psychologically we have been completely broken there is always that fire inside people's bellies you know not just not just our female character who we happen to you know kind of go on this very um experiential journey with but there's something innate within us as human beings um so i think that's the kind of the key message that we really want people to take away from from this is engaging with the themes but also kind of hopefully opening up that psychological question of what does what does it look like to look beyond the horizons that life has offered you so far and yeah and to this level of defiance in the face of adversity it's that thing that you know no matter who you are or what your situation is you can overcome you can overcome and you can fight those your demons whether they be internal or external um and you know patience is proof of that throughout the journey of, of her journey in the film. And for you, Hannah? Oh, I was hoping they'd said it all. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I guess uh, everything that the other two have just said, um, and also just uh, carrying on that conversation of uh, that it, these things are still very much relevant today. It is still, still, you know, that's it's still a fight that we're kind of uh, fighting. Uh, both in terms of kind of sexism and racism and just kind of otherness. Um, so just, yeah, kind of if uh, hopefully it makes people think and kind of question um, sort of what's going on today as well. Mm. And then just finally, can you each tell me what you're going to be working on next? Have you already got the next film lined up or, you know, going to let this one settle, the dust settle and then move on to the next thing? Yeah, so we're um, we're currently in early pre-production with um, a modern set folk horror, um, which uh, Laura's writing and um, I'm going to be directing and Hannah will no doubt be in. <laughs> and I say, I'm, I'm waiting for these two to give me a job again. So. <laughs> Sounds like there's one coming in the post though. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're working on that at the moment and that's, you know, it's going to be a, a bigger scale production and um yeah we're, we're looking forward to uh to diversifying the um the folk horror genre a little bit yeah mm -hmm. amazing well it's been such a pleasure to speak to you all thanks so much for your time and thank you for um, best of luck with the with the release of the film from next week thank, thank you. you very much thank, thank you very much, much. Bye, -bye. Thank you. bye guys bye thank you <laughs>